Well, let's uh, bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to explore these precious letters from dear Paul. We pray, Father, that you'd open our hearts and lives to, the, to your word, that we might grow in grace the knowledge of our Lord and Savior as we commit this time and ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to start a study of what are called the pastoral epistles. But before I do, I want to mention a help wanted ad that I think it was Warren Wearsby put in one of his commentaries. Visualize reading this as a want ad. Men and women wanted for the difficult task of building my church. You'll be often misunderstood even by those working with you. You will face constant attack from an invisible enemy. You may not see the results of your labor, and you will, your full reward will not come till after all your work is completed. It may cost you your home, your ambitions, even your life. Anyone ready to sign up? <laughs> I always like to start these sessions by asking how many of you are in the full-time ministry? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, good for you. Right on. How many of you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? How many of you are in the full-time ministry, whether you know it or not? <laughs> So these letters that we're going to study are not for pastors in the traditional sense. They're for every one of us, and that's really what it's all about here. Now, the New Testament, as you realize, consists of what five Gospels, as I call it. I treat the book of Acts, or Luke, volume 2, as a Gospel. Then we have 13 Pauline epistles. We have eight Hebrew epistles. And then, of course, we have this peculiar book, uh, the, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And uh, the two pr principal doctrinal epistles, of course, are Romans and Hebrews. But uh, we then have seven churches written uh, to by Paul. And uh, then in, among those seven churches are the three that he wrote while in prison. They're called the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But we're going to explore these three that were written not to churches but to pastors. Two to his young protege, um, Timothy, and Titus. Philemon is also one of those, but we usually tag that on to Colossians when we go through that. But as we get into these letters, let's remind ourselves that all Scripture, this is, we'll encounter this in Paul's second letter to Timothy, but all Scripture, not most of it, not just the Torah, all Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. What does that mean? It turns out the Greek word means God-breathed. God breathed. And as a guy that specializes in information sciences, I can tell you it's my persuasion that every letter is there by deliberate design of the Holy Spirit. Every letter. Jesus engages the lawyers in Matthew 22 in a question they couldn't answer. You know, how can David call him Lord? Who, who, you know, whose son is he? Is, uh, uh, Messiah is the son of David. Well, how can, the, how can, the, how can David call him Lord? Remember that? They couldn't answer him. When you study what he said, his entire argument hangs on a yacht. A little yacht before Adonai makes it possessive. How can David call him my Lord? The whole issue hangs on a yacht. And indeed, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The more you study the scripture carefully, the more you discover every detail is there by deliberate design. And it's what? It's profitable for what? For doctrine? What is, what is doctrine? Doctrine, reproof, and correction, and instruction. We, glib that, we, we run that off so glibly when we quote that verse. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. What does that mean? Well, doctrine is it tells you what's right, what's correct. For reproof, it tells you what's not right. Okay? For correction, how to get it right. And for instruction, how to stay right. Okay? Does that help? I don't want to help me to try to understand the subtleties of those you know, four um, uh, attributions. The pastoral epistles. How many of you in the full-time ministry have already sprung that on you? Okay. The overview here, we're going to talk about diversity of gifts. All of us in this room have different gifts. And when we fail to exercise those gifts, we defraud the body of Christ. You need to understand that. We're going to talk about the depth of commitment. Depth of commitment. You all know about the difference between ham and eggs, Right? The chicken that provided the eggs was involved. The pig that provided the ham was committed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
the Jews have a civil uh, lox and bag, uh, uh, lox and and, and uh, cream cheese thing, uh, 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 same kind of thing. Anyway, now the challenges we're going to face are going to be substantial and they're predictable. So these letters are going to deal with our diversity of gifts, our depth of commitment, challenges, and they anticipate today. One of the things that's going to probably surprise us is how piercingly relevant these letters are to us today. What's going on in the church today? As we study the lay of the sea and horizon, we'll discover how much is relevant and anticipated in these letters, not by Paul, but by the Holy Spirit in writing the letters. So the first epistle of Timothy is going to focus on the local church and its minister. And it's going to be charged to guard the deposit. We talk about the assembly and its conduct con concerning order, men and women. There's going to be some very disturbing passages in here for the girls. They're going to hate me before the evening's over. Um, concerning the office of elders and deacons, what is that all about? And the last uh, uh, part of it will be about the minister and his conduct. That's the whole epistle, not the one. We're going to take all this. We're just going to take a chapter two tonight. Second epistle, we'll talk, we'll continue uh, a challenge to faithfulness for the true pastor and testings and end, end time troubles. We're going to find it very eschatological, surprisingly enough. And so the modern church, where is the gospel in the modern church? It's astonishing how many people can go to church and not hear the gospel. I think one of the most universal choruses we hear as we travel by people that are upset because they don't ever hear about the shed blood of Jesus Christ in the churches. Well, that's old-fashioned evangelism. Really? Yeah. Well, that's, where's the gospel? Where's the call to obedience and accountability? I had an interesting discussion with Mike Gendron, who heads up a very interesting ministry. It was primarily the Catholics, but by ministering to Catholics, he came out of Catholicism and he ministers to to uh, Catholics that are uh, 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 re trying to repair those deficiencies. And it's, he says he's learned some interesting lessons about evangelism from that background. There's, he thinks that one of the problems in the church today is that we go to evangelism by non-biblical methods. And he says, Chuck, how many times does the word love occur in the book of Acts? The guide for the early church is the book of Acts. That's the chronicle of the early church, right? How many times does the word love appear in the book of Acts? Answer, zero. Now, he's not, not knocking love. That's not the point. The point is, in those days, the message was our accountability to our Creator. We don't hear much about that today. It's all this quick, easy, you know, go down the sawdust trail, get your get-out-of-hell free card, and boy, that's it. That's not the way they did it in the first century. What about this business of obedience? If you love me, you'll... Get, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, Keep my commandments, he says. What are his commandments? That's a whole other issue. And what about accountability? Are we accountable? Well, we don't earn our salvation. Absolutely not. You're right. Our salvation comes 100% by what Christ did when we, because we're justified by him. So when we accept Christ, our passport to heaven is stamped. We haven't changed to him anything. That's okay. No problem. That part's good. What about, what happens then? Sanctification. What's all that about? Where's the call to obedience and accountability? And of course, this I, which book of the New Testament chronicles the early church? That's, of course, the book of Acts. And how many times the word love appear there? Zero. Zero. That should give us pause. Not that, love's important. Don't misunderstand me. It under, undergirds everything God has done. The whole drama of redemption is the extremes God has gone to because he loves us so much. But that wasn't the early church's goal. What's the symbol of the emergent church? I think it should be an apple with a worm crawling out of it. That's what's emerging, okay? In, through these letters we're going to look at, these pastoral letters, we're going to find some have turned aside. Some have made a shipwreck, Paul says. Some shall fall away. Some have turned after Satan. Some have been led astray. Some have missed the mark. What's our challenge for you and I? Finishing well. That's the challenge for all of us. If you've been called, if you've been saved by Christ, praise God. But now your challenge is to finish well. How tragic it is as we see greats, people with a distinguished history, crash and burn spiritually. Make the, the headlines are continual. Tragic, tragic. Let, let that not be us. 
A couple of quick quotes to give you the flavor of where we're headed here. Second Timothy, we're talking about Second Timothy now, chapter 1. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against this day. Chuck, do you think you can lose your salvation? I says, absolutely can, if it depended on me. But I know whom I believed, and he, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Or from John 10, you've heard my quip. I always attribute it to Walter Martin because it, sound, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it sounds like him. If, God, if you can lose your salvation, then I got a new name for God, Butterfingers, because he's the one that it's all been entrusted to. But finishing well is the real issue. Paul can say, I've fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There's one of those crowns we were asking about, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that do what? Love his appearing. Praise God. Finishing well. That's what it's all about. Let's talk a little bit about the background. I'm just going to excerpt a few things from the Learning the Bible in 24 Hours. You probably have been some time since you've gone through. Let's just refresh. On Damascus Road, Paul, a Jew born a Roman citizen and raised in Tarsus to the best Greek schools as well as the best Jewish schools, educated in Jerusalem as a Pharisee and under Gamaliel. He holds coats while Stephen is stoned, and he then becomes a violent persecutor of the Christian church. And, of course, on the way to Damascus, he's confronted by whom? Jesus Christ. Boy, that was an encounter. And he visits with Ananias. His, Ananias, his blindness is healed, and he's baptized. Then he spends, he stays in Damascus, and during that era, he spends three years in the desert in Arabia. Many people don't realize that. Instructed. And then he returns to become a phenomenon one of the brightest minds that ever walked the planet earth, one of the best educated in the Greek schools, best educated in the Jewish schools, a very unique, very unique human being. And he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And three years after his conversion, he has to leave town in a basket because they're after him. He goes to see Peter and Barnabas, and they're, they're terrified of him because they regard him as the enemy. But uh, they make their peace together and, and acknowledge each other. And after two weeks, he's smuggled out of there, taken to Caesarea and then to Tarsus. He spends 10 years in Tarsus, during which he makes a few visits. But he's still unknown to the believers in Judea. Those that know of him remember that 10 years ago, he was, a, was slaughtering Christians. Barnabas, though, tracks him down, brings him to Antioch, which becomes sort of a, a, the major capital for the early church in the, in the, in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, they teach together for about a year, and then they, along with Titus, uh, bring famine relief money to Judea, and they meet with the church leaders and acknowledge Saul's ministry to the Gentiles and so forth. His name is still Saul at this point. It'll be Paul shortly. And during his first missionary journey, he visits a number of places, one of which is Lystra. He's going to meet a young guy there in Lystra, but he doesn't call him until his next missionary journey. But anyway, he, uh, they, they set out from Antioch to Salamis and uh, then to Paphos, and then they head up, to, up into the uh, uh, area that you and I would think of as uh, Turkey and so forth, but um, the Galatians. And uh, so um, John Mark is with them. They encounter Bar-Jesus, a false prophet. He's struck blind. The governor then becomes a believer. He's impressed with all of that. John Mark then leaves to Jerusalem, and a dispute will occur later over this whole issue. But they go up to, up to Antioch, a different Antioch. There's two Antiochs, okay? Antioch of Syria and the other one. And so, uh, so uh, they're there for quite a while, but the Gentile plot forces them to head on. Head on. So at Lystra, he heals a cripple. At Lystra, he, when he visits the next time, that's when he'll pick up T Timothy, the guy we're going to read the letter to. And uh, they're hailed as gods and so forth. And they're almost killed in each one of these places. They flee to Derby. And each place they win more disciples, but each place they, they are under threat, pers pers physical threat of their lives. And so, okay, then they return the way they came, go back the way they came, in encouraging the churches they planted, and they report everything to the headquarters in Antioch. And uh, 
There's then an event that you need to be clear in your mind because it affects us every day. Council in Jerusalem. This huge controversy erupts over the obligations of Gentiles that become Christians. The Jewish mind was they became Jews and then accept their Messiah. That was their mindset. Does a Gentile have to be circumcised to become a Christian? That was a serious question in those days. Does a Gentile have to keep the Mosaic law? Paul and Barnabas and others go go down to Jerusalem to, to settle this issue because they've discovered that the Gentiles are having incredible conversions and so forth, and they're being obstructed by these Judaizers, those that believe they have to become Jewish in order to become a Christian. Peter also is going to testify. And I love the way Peter summarizes his presentation. It says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God and put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? He's a Jew talking to Jews here. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they are. See the inversion? He's not saying they're going to be like, guys, we might be as effective as they are. It's just, that's what they build up to in the, in the, as Paul. And, and, the, and there are two problems that are raised in this council, and we need to understand both of them. And the first one, of course, is the principal one. What must a Gentile do to be saved? They've got to resolve that. But there's something else that lurks behind the scenes that's not obvious until you study that passage. What has become of Israel? If a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to become a Christian, What's to become of Israel? Has all this been for nothing? Our whole history? And James, who's chairing this thing, speaks out. He says, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, quote, and he's quoting from Amos 9 here, After this will I return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. What's he talking about? The Davidic kingdom. The millennium is a fulfillment of the Davidic uh, covenant. So he points out, the Gentiles should abstain from idols, from fornication, and from things strangled in blood. That's it. There's no Ten Commandments, no circumcision, just a few basics. There's no commitment to the ceremonial laws, circumcision, so forth. But the other issue is the issue of Israel's destiny. And Paul will write three chapters in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, 11, hammering away that God is not finished with Israel. They have a whole future once this has all been accomplished. Well, this leads anyway after that. That's a very important conference because a convert does not have to keep the Mosaic law. But we're going to discover that he had Timothy circumcised. Why? That'll be a question on your final. Okay. In any case, second missionary journal. We've just, we summarized the first one. Now the second one takes place. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus primarily. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas argue over Mark. They're all upset. Paul is really upset with John Mark because he didn't cut it. When they went up into the rough country of Galatians, he cut loose. Probably came from a young guy from a rich background, a little too rough for him. So Paul felt he was a quitter. Barnabas and he have a big argument over this. So they split up. That's God's way of broadening the outreach here. Later on, later years, Paul and Mark will make up and that'll all be healed over. But right now there's an issue between them. And so Barnabas takes Mark with him to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas to Galatia. And at Lystra... When he gets to Lystra, that's where he encounters Timothy to join them. I don't have evidence. I suspect that he probably met him on his first trip as impressed. But on this trip, he actually recruits him to join him, and he does. He becomes an important sidekick to Paul, which is one reason his letters are so important to us that we're going to go through here. So Paul's going to pick him up here. We're now at about Acts 16, if you're following us. You're feeling your way through Acts by the time we get there. And then they go to Iconium and Antioch, and uh, they publish the decisions of the council in Jerusalem as to what the ground rules are for Gentile conversions and so on. And then they get to go to, he tries to go to Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit blocks him from that. And uh, it's interesting how the, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit can slam doors. Paul wanted to go there very badly. The Holy Spirit said, no, no way. How did he say that? I don't know. Circumstances, whatever. And uh, at night, though, he has a vision. In his vision, there's a Macedonian, somebody from over here, from you know, on, uh, way west in Macedonia, says, come on over and help us. We're in trouble. You know who that guy was in the dream? 
Make a guess. We don't know who he was, but make a guess. Luke. Luke. That's my suspicion. Just a suspicion. And uh, so, we do find when he gets there uh, to to, uh, Troas that uh, Luke joins him. A doctor, a slave, and he becomes a, a, a confidant and a, a, a major thing. And they, and they sail then for Macedonia. They go to Philippi, encounter a meeting with an evil spirit. The crowd attacks them. They're flogged, imprisoned, freed by an earthquake. Isn't that an exciting career path, huh? Do you want to be flogged, imprisoned? You know, if you play your cards right, you can be just like Paul. <laughs> Jailers converted, and then they travel to Thessalonica, and uh, he convinces both Jews and Greeks. But the Jews, in each place, it's the Jews that stir up the riots, and uh, he leaves secretly for Berea. Better reception there, but the mob stirs him up again, and uh, they leave for Athens. Silas and Timothy stay behind as his representatives. Paul speaks at the Mars Hill, that famous event, and uh, and then he departs for Corinth. We'll talk about Corinth later on as we get into the whole background of the other letters. But uh, Silas and Timothy bring news from Thessalonica. He writes the Thessalonican letters and uh, spent almost two years there despite uh, uh, um, opposition. That's in Corinth. And so uh, it's interesting to read the Thessalonian letters because they're so full of eschatological insights, yet he just he planted this church, and two weeks later, two, three weeks, during those two or three weeks, he teaches them the rapture, all that stuff. Because he reminds them all of that when he writes the letters to them. Then they sail to Ephesus. They want him to stay, but he has to keep moving. So they finally end up going back home. And that ends the second missionary journey. We'll summarize the third before we get to the second letter. We're in the first letter that Paul writes to Timothy. And uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Pretty straightforward opening of 1 Timothy. The word commandment here, that means by a royal commission. He's actually sent by whom? The king of kings. That's pretty exciting to realize that. We need to understand that we can be just like Paul in that regard. Can you be sent by the ruler of the universe? Absolutely. He's a great guy to work for. And the retirement program's out of this world. (laughs) He's our savior. Ten times in these pastoral epistles, that's the way he'll be labeled. Our savior. Our hope, our blessed hope. And he is coming for us, and that should be the ultimate encouragement for all of us. If we're in the ministry, we're going to be in times of stress. There's going to be challenges. We need to keep ourselves focused on the blessed hope. That's why it's called the blessed hope, because it sees us through these things. Okay, second verse, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I introduced I, I summarized Paul by just doing a quick skim through the Acts uh, journeys. What about Timothy? Before we jump in this letter, let's understand a little bit about Timothy. What's he all about? He was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother. So his mother was Jewish, his father was not. And uh, there's no mention that his father was saved. He apparently was influenced by his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. They were both known for their sincere faith, and they're the ones that really tutored him. Praise God for that. And he was living at Lystra when Paul visited that city on his first journey. He lived, he lived there then, but he wasn't called to the second journey. He apparently had earned a good reputation. And uh, Paul probably, he may not, there's no reason to believe that he was the one that led him to Christ. More than likely it was, uh, you know, the grandmother and mother. But he probably had ordained the young minister uh, finally and had great confidence in him, we'll discover as we go along here. At any rate, he already knew and believed the Old Testament scriptures thanks to his mother and grandmother. And so that's why Paul could pick him up as a promising protege. And his promise for the ministry was recognized early, as we'll see reconfirmed several times in these letters. And apparently, there's also the hint that there were certain prophetic utterances confirmed that confirmed his appointment. And um, we should recognize that happens today. That happens today. There are some groups that overemphasize some of these gifts. There's other groups that deny these gifts, but these gifts are around, and some of them are indeed legitimate. Paul became like a spiritual father to a young man, and he refers to him as my true son in the faith, my dear son. That's a repeated phrase by Paul to, to express the endearment and the role that Timothy, this young Timothy had. 
And so he became a companion, one of his most trusted uh, fellow laborers. All through his epistles, you'll find him referred to. And he became his representative and messenger on several occasions. Again, all through his letters. And uh, six of Paul's epistles include Timothy in the salutations. He not only did write a letter to someone, he included Timothy as, a, uh, 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 as his companion. And uh, now, because of his mixed parentage, he has him circumcised. And many people are upset by that. Why? You know, what, what is this? I thought, I thought that didn't matter. It did in terms of his ministry. This seems, see, this seems contrary to the decision at the Jerusalem Council that occurred just before the Second Missionary Journal. But it, Titus, in contrast, was not compelled to be circumcised because he was fully Gentile. He was not Jewish. Timothy was half and half, so to speak. So Paul doesn't want his ministry clouded or curtailed by him being uncircumcised. He wanted to maximize the effectiveness of his ministry. We need to remember that. There's things you don't have to do, but you might do just to maximize your acceptability to certain groups. And so this could have been an occasion for serious offense in some Jewish circles if he had remained uncircumcised. But Paul relieves that problem. It's interesting, many people don't realize when Paul is at on Mars Hill in Athens, his quotes are not from the Bible. They're from three Greek poets of the past. Why? Because that was the, something they would understand. You follow me? And uh, anyway... So Timothy becomes so dear to Paul that in his last message, he makes a uh, touching appeal for Timothy to come join him in his final days in prison. His second letter, we're reading his first letter, but his second letter, it's probably the last thing he wrote before he died. And he, 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 he knew it was a final situation, and so he uh, pleaded for Timothy to come and uh, bring his notebooks that he had and so forth. After being released from his first Roman imprisonment, Paul and Timothy by side evidently visited some of the churches in Asia, including Ephesus. And uh, after his second, uh, 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 after that also, he apparently may have also gone to Spain. That's the big debate about that. On this departure from Ephesus, Paul left Timothy behind to provide leadership to the congregation. So he's really matured by then because he's leaving Timothy to minister at one of the most challenging places to minister, as we'll touch on here in a minute. And uh, then he wrote to Timothy a letter, 1 Timothy, urging him on in his ministry at Ephesus. Are we together? Okay. We gather Timothy was probably somewhat passive, timid, retiring, easily intimidated. He was very young, and he might have been very light, frail. He wasn't a strong, dominant kind of character. Paul is repeatedly spurring him on to action all through his letters. And uh, he's rather young. <laughs> Paul exhorts him, let no one despise your youth. He said that to him 15 years later. <laughs> so he must have been really young when he started. We don't know how old he was. But when he says, let no one despise your youth, we may miss the point that that was 15 years after he got started here. Right? And uh, he said, let nothing, including his youth, stand in the way of his performance of his duty. You see, Paul really is a military commander. He uses military terms, as we'll see here shortly. He's like a good soldier supposed to fight the good fight, we find in 1 Timothy 1. And aggressively, aggressively protecting and propagating the gospel, using the full range of all his gifts. And yet we'll find that Timothy still is easily discouraged because Paul is having to re-emphasize re that again and again. And so uh, Paul even had to tell him to hang in there, finish his work there at Ephesus. He may have had physical problems, um, and he obviously had physical uh, periods of discouragement. And so uh, there, it appears that some of the church members were not giving proper respect to him as God's servant. So Now, the organization is pretty straightforward. In 1 Timothy, the first, cha first uh, chapter is going to be about faith in the church, and it's going to be doctrinal. Second uh, chapter will be having to do with order in the church. How do you organize? How do you do those things? We'll talk about officers of the church, deacons and elders and so forth. And also, interestingly enough, in the fourth chapter, that apostasy was on its way. And 1 Timothy 4 is an important chapter for us to understand in our day-to-day -day especially. And then we have the duties detailed in uh, chapters 5 and 6. In the second and final letter of Paul's, he talks about the afflictions and the activities of the church. Afflictions, activity, and allegiance. 
I lifted this from one of the commentaries. And if you've been to seminary, you always have to start with the same letter. That somehow proves things are true. You always start with P or A or whatever. So, so we have the afflictions, the activity, and the allegiance. Anyway, we sometimes get a little facetious or cynical about alliteration, which seems to be a, sin- a, a seminary stamp of approval somehow. Faith of the church. There are three basic forms of church government. One's called the Episcopal form. That's where one or several at the top are in charge, and they're typically outside the local church. That's typically called the Episcopal form. The Presbyterian form is those that have representatives elected from the membership that run the church. So it's locally controlled. Congregational is the people themselves make the decisions. So there's various forms of church governments, but they, they more or less take one of those forms. They all can work well, but none of them are any better than the, the leadership, the integrity of the leadership, spiritual condition of the leadership. And so they all can be characterized by strifes and divisions if not handled um, with spiritual maturity. So Paul's going to emphasize that there are two aspects of a spiritual officer. He must be a man of faith, obviously. It's shocking to realize how many people aren't. He must be motivated by love. Pretty basic stuff. And it's disturbing how often those one or both are absent if you get into these counseling sessions with the leadership. And um, Paul explained there were three responsibilities in the local church. To teach sound doctrine. The first 11 verses of this book, are, this chapter are going to be about that. To proclaim the gospel. It's amazing. The whole emergent church avoids doctrine in the first place. Gee, that's not very popular. What about proclaiming the gospel? What is the gospel? Most, many pastors can't answer that question. Paul defines it in the first uh, four chapters of 1 Corinthians 15. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he completed. And then to defend the faith. And every one of us in the room is going to have an opportunity in our lifetimes to show our true colors in that regard. In fact, all three. Okay, we're down to the third verse. We're making progress here. As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So he's instructing Timothy. The word charge there is a Greek term, which is the term that's used when you give strict orders from a superior officer. It's a military term he's using here. And he uses that eight times in his two letters to Timothy. So it's clear that he's laying it out for the kid. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is faith. So do. See, understand where Timothy was. He was in Ephesus. That was the heartland of the mystery religions. The temple of Hadrian, the temple to Trajan, and the great temple of Diana, which of course gets very prominent uh, positioning in the book of Acts. These were all centered in uh, Ephesus, and they're all based on Greek mythology. And it's easy for us to look back and dismiss that as mythology, but we have failed to realize that culture was committed to that mythology. And uh, you know, we could talk more about the mythology our culture is committed to. It's even sillier than theirs, but let's move on. Ephesus was not the easiest place to minister, to which I have a question. Is any place easy? Of course not. But this, this one had its difficulties. Known throughout the world for lascivious worship, Diana. Yet he done there that uh, Paul was there three years. All they that dwelt in the province, and when it says Asia, it doesn't mean Asia as we think of it. It's the province of Asia, which today is roughly equivalent to Turkey. So all they that dwelt in the province of Asia heard the words of Jesus. That was Paul's accomplishment. He did that without electronics, without publishing, without printing presses, but he made an impact. Praise God. Now, he wrote this letter from Macedonia while Timothy was in Ephesus in order to encourage him and give him some management advice. Now, heterodoxy has infested the church. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like today where you've got uh, Bible churches lighting incense candles and using icons and what have you? Legalism and speculative theology based on myths and genealogies. That's today. And there's two basic issues facing every believer. One is interior, the creed. What do they really believe? The other is exterior, 
their conduct, creed and conduct of the interior, exterior aspects for every believer, every believer. And they will reflect the effectiveness of the pastor in charge. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. A pure heart. That's in contrast to our old nature. What's our heart like? Desperate, incurably wicked, right? Jeremiah 17, 9. And of good conscience. Conscience that, that to know with is what it really says in the Greek. 21 times in his letters, six times just in these epistles. It is possible to sin against your conscience. Did you know that? So it becomes defiled. That's in Titus. We'll deal with that. And uh, even seared like scar tissue. You can sear your conscience just like you can have some scar tissue that makes you insensitive in certain areas. Same thing. Same kind of thing. Love here is, a, 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 is an active concern for others, which means you don't gossip about them or in any way bring harm to them. We won't get into a whole deviation here on the most painful sin. You've heard me on that before. Let's move on to verse 6. From which have, uh, some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Vain jangling. What do I mean by vain jangling? Some people talk about 7-Eleven music. Seven words repeated 11 times and totally devoid of any theology. It's interesting to contrast some of the devotional songs we sing today with the incredible richness of some of the old hymns. Some of those old hymns are lessons in theology where today it's 7-Eleven music or worse. You know, a singer has no more right to sing a lie than a teacher has to teach a lie. And some of the songs you sing are... Paul continues, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say or whereof they affirm. Wow. Paul's taken after these people. Vain jangling, meaningless talk, empty chatter, beautiful words, vapid content. Some even are songs which teach little or no doctrine. It's interesting, those who teach error always do it with assurance. <laughs> I think that's interesting. I came across that. I thought, that's an interesting comment. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Romans 7, we just got through that in our study of Romans, right? We need to see that the law is good. We need also to recognize our inability to keep the law. The law is good. We're not. That's basically the issue. The idea that in and of yourself you can please God absolutely contradicts the Word of God. You cannot meet His standard. That's the point. That's what the law is there for, is to tell you how many inches there are in a yard or whatever. It's not given to save us, but to reveal that God is holy and that you and I are not holy. We're not saved by good works. We're saved unto good works by our Savior. That's what He's for. The law is there to prove to us, to have us to realize our need for the Savior. So he continues to, first, in Tim, to Timothy. Paul says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. I wonder what that's talking about. Sounds like today, doesn't it? For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The role of the law. Paul lists 14 kinds of people condemned by the law. We just went through those, and there's a bunch of, there's more in Romans and Galatians. The law cannot save lost sinners. The law is to expose, restrain, and convict the lawless. I was at a conference once. There was empty chairs. Somebody says, are these seats saved? I says, they're not even under conviction. <laughs> Now, it can only reveal the need for a Savior. When a sinner believes in Jesus Christ, he is freed from the curse of the law. Galatians 3. Galatians 3. How many people get caught up in the Messianic stuff, and it's, and it's wonderful, you learn a lot, and yet you find yourself drawn back under the law. Be careful. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're freed from the curse of the law. Five of the Ten Commandments are listed in this list that we just went through. Honor thy father and a mother for murderers and fathers and murders of mothers. Remember? That's 
Thou shalt not murder. Remember, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. Thou shalt not commit adultery. For remember the whoremongers, fornicators, them that file themselves with mankind. Thou shalt not steal. For men stealers. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Liars, perjury, see. Five of the Ten Commandments happen to be included in this quick sweep by Paul in this letter. And he continues, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. By the way, all believers are in the ministry if you indeed are a child of God. God saved you, did it for a reason, your great adventures to discover what reason that was. What are your gifts? What is he calling you to? That's the great discovery. Paul continues, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. And Paul's talking about himself here. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was a blasphemer because he denied the deity of Jesus Christ and he forced others to deny it. And when he denied Christ, he forced others to deny Christ. He was a persecutor because he used physical power to try to destroy the church. Paul's talking about himself here. Acts chapter 8, first four verses. And he's saying ignorance here. I did it ignorant. He's appealing to a special Jewish law in Leviticus 5 and Numbers 15. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Exceedingly abundant. Paul uses frequently a Greek prefix called hooper. Hooper. Uh, super increase in faith in 2 Thessalonians 1. Super abounding power in Ephesians 1. Super conqueror in Romans 8. More than conquerors, remember? Super. It's from that Greek prefix that we get the word hyper. Hypertension, whatever. It's the same, same Greek term, if you will. Paul's using it in super increase in faith, super abounding power. Super, he uses that a lot. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? What did he come in for? What did, what's he, what did he show up for? To save sinners. That's what he came for. But Paul adds, of whom I am chief. I love that. Paul's point, of course, is if God could save him, God can save any of us. That's the point that he's making here. He considered himself the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians and the least of all saints in Ephesians 3. Paul did not have an exaggerated ego here. He had reason to be egocentric. Uh, Benjamin of the tribe of Benjamin and so forth, and he could go through the whole list. He had reason that he could boast if he wanted to, but he does that only to make another point, that he has nothing to boast of. And notice he doesn't say, I was chief. He says, I am chief. I like that. You know, he doesn't put it into the contrary for ex subjunctive. It's right now, yeah. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might, uh, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Grace and mercy. God's love in action. God turned the persecutor, Paul, into a preacher. He converted the murderer into a missionary. How neat. God did that. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, indivis invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Here Paul, as he's writing, suddenly, almost involuntarily, bursts into a doxology. He just sort of sticks that in. It's a sort of a unmitigated praise, just stuck in the middle of his letter here. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. Did you love that? Son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee. See, there's that reason we believe that there was some specific laying on of hands, prof prophecy going on involving his calling here. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Paul's reminding him of his send-off back in Lystra. We are, you and I are in a warfare. We need to take this to heart ourselves. And where do, how do we prepare for that? Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Put that in your notes. Review Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Understand the seven elements of your armor. You need twice, Paul says, to put on all of them. You have a real enemy and you are, he's knowledgeable and resourceful. He knows all about you and he's against you. And you are on his turf. What armor are we talking about? 
girded with truth. Check that out. Breastplate of righteousness. What's all that about? Whose righteousness? Not ours, his. Feet shod with preparation. Oh, you mean we got to prepare? It's not automatic? No, let's take some homework here. A shield of faith. Does your shield have holes in it? Fix it now, not later. Your helmet of salvation. Owning it's not enough. If you're not wearing it, doesn't do you any good. How do you can tell who's not wearing their helmet? By the bandages, right? <laughs> the sword of the Spirit. That's the one we all know about. What's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. But everybody forgets the heavy artillery. They, start, they leave off at verse 17. Oh, verse 18 there too. The heavy artillery, action at a distance weapons, prayer, so easily done, so readily overlooked. Spend some time on your knees in private with the Lord and pray for everything, for yourself and for that which the Holy Spirit lays on your heart. Prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He wants to do. There's an imperative Paul throws in here with Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Glib phrase, let's examine it. It's in the imperative mood. That means it's a command. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's in the present tense, which means be continually strong. Be strong. Always. Continually. And it's in passive voice. You receive the action. You receive the action. The power of His might, not yours, His might. Moving on, 1 Timothy 1, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a heavy verse. Here's a couple of guys that Paul claims... He delivered to Hasatan, Satan, to teach them a lesson. Boy, there's another prayer you might remember when you have a setback of some kind. Pray that the lessons not be wasted. There's some lessons you want to have once and only once. I had a very, very dark evening once where a lot of people were mourning a certain situation with the family, and, and the leader came in, a guy I respect very highly. And he gave a prayer that surprised me. He says, may the lessons not be wasted. And what a weird prayer for people who are grieving over a situation. And yet he knew more about it than I did, obviously. And I thought, what a provoc... I thought about that for years after that. Pray that the lessons not be wasted. Wow. So anyway, these two guys are delivered to his hate. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. That they may learn not to blaspheme. I'll just leave that with you. But you don't want to... Holy faith and good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith because, and because of that, they made, it, they made their situation a shipwreck. I think Paul knew a lot about shipwrecks. He survived several of them. These two apostates, he mentions them elsewhere and has little good to say about them. We'll encounter them in the second letter again. There's an apostolic prerogative suggested here that also shows up in 1 Corinthians 5. And Peter also exercises this apostolic prerogative in Acts 5. And this may or may not have something to do with the keys of the kingdom, and that's a whole other study we won't derail here to get into. But for your next session, I want you to study 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for Timothy. We thank you, Father, that the lessons he needed might not be wasted on us, that we might also understand our need to be courageous, our need to stand fast, our need to be finishing well. We thank you for Paul's encouragement. We thank you for his command. We thank you for his example. We thank you for his elegance. We pray, Father, that you would help us to appropriate these lessons to our own selves and our own walk, that in all these things we might be more effective stewards of those challenges that you place before us as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.